Good, uh, uh, good evening. Um, welcome, welcome to the Norton Museum of Art. We're uh, delighted to have you tonight. And before I start uh, speaking on so on, I may ask everybody to switch off the phone, please. Silent switch off, send them in uh, somewhere else, I don't know, but no phone, thank you. Um, I really appreciate that. So first of all, it's always um, uh, my pleasure to welcome you all here, all of you here. And I would like uh, to thank all the one who are support of the museum, um, starting with our member, Chairman Sarah Circle, no, Director of Circle, and all the circles. Uh, our trustee, and we have a few of them tonight, so thank you. It's always wonderful when you do so many programs, and believe me, we're doing a lot of programs, and some of my trustees say, there's too many things going on. I say, well, if you don't do too many, they're going to tell you there's not enough. So, so we decided to go for more than less, and then you picked up what you want to do. How cool is that, okay? So, but on the thank you, I want to thank our Dawson, because we have several of them. Could you raise your hand, please? Wow, look at that. Because the Dawson are an amazing group of ambassadors. They're giving the time, we train them, or we kind of share our knowledge with them, and then they learn and learn and learn more, and they start to get more knowledgeable than our own curator, which is kind of sometimes interesting. But anyway, it's a lot of fun, and without the Dawson, it's really um, uh, such a dynamic group, and we have, I think, first 23 new Dawson recently, I think. Uh, 22, uh, and we have now more and more of them bilingual, which is important. And then, specifically, you may see them in a the gallery, but we have also a group of uh, 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 teenager uh, ambassador who are uh, teenager kids who are trained bilingual Dawson, Spanish English, of course, and really are around the museum answering your question and so on. So uh, that's really a kind of a very uh, exciting part of the. So, but thank you for all of you to be here uh, tonight. And uh, tonight is also uh, specifically a lecture organized through the Friend of Chinese Art. So as you know, the museum has five departments and we have support group of each category. But tonight is to celebrate an amazing Chinese collection of art, which was, uh, you know, uh, started by Mr. Norton and then uh, continued to be uh, improved and, and developed through the years. And we have uh, several uh, major donors about uh, that category, but the chair of the group is Mr. Niblack, who is here with us, and he's been a major, major supporter of Chinese art, uh, which is uh, really wonderful. And think about it, put things in perspective. Many museums are encyclopedic. We are not. We're not, uh, we're not going from antiquity to contemporary. But we do have really art from a culture which is um, so vast and so um, uh, uh, extraordinarily interesting, uh, Chinese or Asian art in general. And think about the impact you have on the community here. Many, many uh, kids here will never have the money to travel anywhere. So how do they start to get to understand diversity, differences between culture? How do they understand um, uh, to accept uh, differences through the art and creativity if they cannot go to a museum and see culture from a different world? And in our case, we have uh, China extremely well represented on two floors. And I really uh, want to continue. Three floors, say, oh, yes, you're right. Laurie's on the back, say, three. I forget Chinese export. I will argue it's a Europe pen on the top. Could we argue with that or they're really Chinese? Okay, I'm not going to start the argument with my colleague over there about the Chinese export uh, porcelain, but anyway, yes, you're right, on the free floor, sorry, Laurie, and it's really uh, exciting to have uh, all of that. So now I'm completely out and off script, but sorry. Um, after thanking all of you, and also I want a special thanks to Gail and Paul Gross because their generosity uh, is supporting the, the lecture tonight through the Gail and Paul Gross uh, Education Endowment. So now my great pleasure is to introduce uh, the uh, speaker tonight, the lecturer, Emmanuel Ducamp, who has the unfortunate luck to know me for more than 30 years. Or am I the unfortunate luck to know you? But <laughs> yes, it's fishing. Or maybe I have the unfortunate luck to know you for first. Anyway, uh, Emmanuel is a law and history of art graduate from the University of Paris uh, 10. He's also an editorial uh, director of the publishing company Alain Gourcuff, editor in Paris from 92 to 2001. In capacity, he coordinated publication of a series of works on Russian architecture, fine and decorative art in the 18th and 19th century. And I'm 
it's, this doesn't really give credit to that, his knowledge of Russian culture, decorative art, from as early as the 17th or even 16th century, but 18th specifically, 19th and 20th century, is unbelievable. And uh, unfortunately, we cannot do any trip to Russia right now, but when that's reopened, if you want a great trip to Russia, go with him. You'll see everything. Um, with uh, Oleg Neverov, the curator of the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, he has contributed to the production of great private collection of Imperial Russia. And he also directed a publication on Sarkai Selo uh, the, and the Palace and the Park of the Imperial Summer um, in St. Petersburg and many other books on Russia, including also currently working on a book on Bavarian, Bavarian Palace and Castle. Um, but he also has a passion for garden. And Emmanuel is here for 10 days. So if you have a beautiful garden, he loves to see gardens. So every year we're taking to new gardens. Um, and it's really a subject is serious most. And um, he has also uh, developed a very uh, a deep uh, interest on royal and aristocratic park around uh, across Europe, um, in which he published a number of uh, watercolor preserved in public, I mean, a book on watercolor and park and so on. He's a member of the Association of uh, the Parc Botanique de France and the board of the Society des Amateurs de Jardin. He is a visiting professor at the Ecole du Louvre, which is very prestigious, and regularly give lecture on subjects in Europe and the state. He gave lecture at the Met, at the Jean Paul Getty uh, Museum, San Francisco Museum, Society of Art, and of course the Norton Museum of Art. Um, it's really uh, a pleasure to have Emmanuel again here, and uh, please join me and um, welcome Emmanuel, who's going to talk about China and Chinoiserie between reality and dream and how Chinese culture has been influencing so many things around the world, but specifically also uh, the decorative art uh, in Europe. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, before embarking on this rather exotic uh, venture of ours uh, in China and elsewhere, I want to express my gratitude to Guillain, uh, without whom I wouldn't be here. I've known him for 30 years, uh, indeed, and uh, this has been a pleasure. We fight sometimes, but you know what they say, you fight with your best friends first. Uh, I also want to express my gratitude to Laurie Barnes, the curator of the collection of uh, Asian Heart here, <laughs> who has been extremely helpful because she's provided me with very good images. I had taken images last year, which I thought uh, to use, but she's provided me with better images and, uh, and uh, uh, knowledge about some works of art of the collection here, which I have interwoven within my talk. Uh, light, please, Scott, thank you. <clears throat> it wasn't until the late 13th century that the world started to hear about the distant lands of China, which Marco Polo explored on behalf of the Mongol emperor Kublai Khan and described in the book of the marvels of the world. Everything sounded marvelous indeed uh, about them, even more extraordinary than what can be said about them, wrote the Portuguese missionary Gaspar da Cruz in the late 16th century. So extraordinary that it would soon have the Western world not only craving for its treasure, but also, also elaborating and dreaming of another fabricated China, as the real one was so inaccessible. Before the 13th century, European understanding of the Far East had much more to do with imagination than with actual knowledge or the experience of the Orient. Even though the Romans already knew about Chinese silks and raved for them, the intangible Far East remained much of a mystery until uh, adventurous Europeans such as Marco Polo reached the distant lands of Asia. Sent out east with his father, who was a papal envoy, to visit the Mongol emperor Kublai Khan, Marco Polo remained in China nearly for 20 years, uh, from 12, 1277 to 1295, before coming to Europe, coming back to Europe, and dictating his somewhat flowery memories to his jail companion, Rustichello da Pisa. 
Later published as the Travels of Marco Polo, they prompted the beginning of a fascination never to end, especially after the Chinese closed their borders to outsiders for about uh, two centuries, as from 1368. In the early 16th century, Portuguese caravels reached the coast of China, but their ports would remain uncompromisingly closed to direct trade as late as 1757. So the Portuguese during the 16th century first, through the Casada India, then the Dutch, through the Dutch India Company, better known as VOC for Vereinigte Ostindische Compagnie, in the 17th century, basically ruled over indirect trade with China. The VOC having been granted in 1602 a 20-year monopoly to conduct colonial activities in Asia. The most sought-after treasures from China were what the Europeans would quickly nickname white gold, i.e. porcelain, which had been made in China as from the 3rd century AD, but the production of which reached a peak under the Yuan dynasty, that is in the 13th and the 14th century, and then under the Ming dynasty, that is the 14th until the 17th century. Early pieces which would reach Europe struck the Westerners by the perfection of both material and technique, which doesn't come as a surprise when one sees such a bowl as this one on the screen, which is in the collection of the museum here, extraordinary for its translucency and the delicacy of its inside decor. The celebrated Blanc de Chine, uh, white from China, made in Dewa, as from the Ming dynasty, were actually at the origin of this appellation of white gold. And every country and their sovereign in Europe wanted to uncover the secrets of its technique. The pieces brought into Europe by the Portuguese vessels were to be used by the Westerners in a decorative manner, having sometimes nothing to do with their original use, as is amply demonstrated with these 18th century pieces now on the screen. Uh, why not add decorative uh, figures to a uh, can like this one uh, to make actually uh, it impossible to use uh, that can afterwards, but making it uh, very decorative? And if you didn't get a candelabra in your shipment, well, why not make one using cups tiled on top of each other, not forgetting the indispensable pillbox <laughs> on the top. And what about turning two other cups here and there uh, in a perfume burner with Chinese dragons guarding the precious scents emanating from it? The, ima the imagination of the marchand mercier, the dealers specialized in dealing with luxury goods at that time, certainly knew no limits throughout the uh, 18th century, as demonstrated by these other candelabras with storks perched on uh, their rocks in a dignified attitude. Or this covered pot here, mounted in the early 18th century in France, or this one, crackled glaze, mounted also uh, in Paris under the reign of Louis XV uh, around 1730 or uh, 1740. <clears throat> the taste for mounted Chinese porcelain never disappeared, as shown by uh, this group of Céladon vases, mostly from the reign of Louis XV or uh, Louis XVI, or these lovely, handsome vases from the collection of the Norton Hare uh, with the porcelain dating back to the late 18th century, but the mounts having been made in the Rococo style uh, in the 19th century. <clears throat> as early as 1602, the Dutch had captured a Portuguese ship laden with another type of Chinese porcelain, that of blue and white. 
Like Blanc de Chine, blue and white had been produced by the Chinese from a very early period, and here is an, an, early, century, an early 15th century, sorry, blue and, tile, blue and white tile from the collection of the Norton, which is in the galleries. The sale of this type of ware in the West immediately proved a big success, not only because it was aesthetically very pleasing, but also because it soon prompt, prompted the Dutch Delft faience maker to replicate Chinese objects with a similar decor. The Blanc de Chine were indeed quickly overtaken or overruled, if you prefer, by these white, white and blue pieces, also for a very practical reason. They were much easier to reproduce, that is, fake, or better said, copy, because the blue painted decor would easily cover the defects of the ceramic base, which was not porcelain that the, the Europeans didn't know uh, how to make until then. Uh, and uh, while they were able to make rather crude earthenware or faience ware instead. For decorative purposes, indeed, the quality of the ceramic did not really matter, only the overall effect, as can be seen from this porcelain cabinet at Schloss Charlottenburg in Berlin, where the walls are basically covered from floor to ceiling with brackets supporting vases, ceramic, plates, anything, not always very close to the eye. So some may have been originals, like this dish here in the collection of the Norton. Some may have been interpretations. It is interesting to see that in that room, the dado of the room is also done in the blue and white Chinese manner to sort of complement the rest of the decor. It, is, it was no different at the Trianon de Porcelaine that you see on the screen right now, Louis XIV's private retreat in the park at Versailles, which was erected from 1760. It was picturesquely decorated outside with rows of blue and white vases, that pretended to be porcelain, but which were not. There were actually faience vases, as the originals would have been a bit too costly, even for the king of France. In this case, the blue and white tiles, uh, or urns and vases, were simply obtained from workshops at either Rouen, Nevers, Lisieux, or saint Clément, which were already specialized in that type of ware in France. It was not only the Dutch or the French who imitated the Chinese ware, but very naturally the Portuguese who had been the first ones to lay their hands on these exotic treasures. As this painting currently on display at the Norton exemplifies, since the plate displayed on the mantel here are thought to be Portuguese. Chinese merchants also quickly realized the fantastic commercial opportunity which the craze for oriental ceramics represented for them. And they soon went into producing porcelain exclusively destined to be exported. As this image of a shop dealing in Chinese export pieces from the Victoria and Albert shows, that trade was immensely successful. And I'm grateful to Lori because this is a fantastic, possibly the best image of a Chinese export or Chinese porcelain shop uh, somewhere in the West. <clears throat> the Chinese porcelain makers not only did confirm to the to conform, sorry, to the taste of their Western clients, they even produced objects unknown to China. This mustard pot from the collection here, for example, is decorated with uh, motifs typical of the late Ming dynasty, but has a definitely Dutch shape, and orders for thousands of similar mustard pots appear in the records of the Dutch India Company. And so is this Monteith, a totally Western object originally manufactured in silver to clean and refresh the glasses of wine brought to the table in fashionable households. The foot of the wine glass would be placed 
in the notches that you see here around the rim with the bowl of the glass submerged in water in the basin, either to be cooled, but also to be cleaned of all the deposits, which were very common at the time, as winemaking was not always as professional as it is today. Such monteith to accommodate the Western market were first produced in Chinese porcelain at the end of the 1600s. My favorite object in the collection here, though in the blue and white porcelain range, is this absolutely delightful garden stand, which was originally an incense burner, that is the bottom part of it. It was mounted in Germany, where a faience domed top with an accompanying decor was created, added, so much so that the piece ended up looking like a crazy contraption i.e. a pierced vase. Other blue and white pieces testify to the everlasting taste for such a successful combination of two colors. The blue canton, an expression appearing in 1797, being one of them. It refers to the great Chinese trading port of Canton, uh, now Guangzhou, from which it came. And by 1805, merchants referred to this sturdy and comparatively inexpensive ware, which proved incredibly popular in, U in Europe, but also in the United States, as blue and white of a landscaped pattern and of a good but common kind. George Washington and his family used blue and white content, such as this one, as their everyday wear. It remained in demand well into the 19th century and became a part of the heritage of many American families, including that of Thomas Jefferson. And this piece here is in the Norton collection. It is interesting to note that if the Chinese went into producing special objects for the Western market, like those I just showed, they were also influenced by the visual vocabulary of their primary clients, as shown by this plate from the Norton here on the left, where the Chinese porcelain is decorated with an entirely Western scene, inspired by the Flemish painter David Tenier the Youngest. The enamel vase on the right is similarly decorated with a Western scene, with the Chinese, which the Chinese might have thought would please their customers abroad. That other plate, this one, on the other hand, also in the collection of the Norton, shows a chinoiserie subject designed by a Dutch artist by the name of Cornelis Pronk, as if the Chinese dealers thought a chinoiserie devised by a Western artist would better appeal to Westerners than a chinoiserie devised by a Chinese artist. After having examined Chinese ware proper, let's explore now further its decorative use or influence within Western residences. As it would be far-fetched to try and do it for the whole of Europe, I shall focus on lesser known uh, German and Russian examples, as well as one from Italy and later one from Spain. One of the most interesting European places to visit to realize the extent of this chinoiserie blue and white craze is definitely Schloss Nymphenburg outside of Munich, one of the country residences of the Wittelsbach family, the rulers of the dukedom and subsequently the kingdom of Bavaria. And I remind you here that Schloss, which is the name I shall use, is the German word for chateau or castle, but without uh, having the, the sort of medieval uh, sense to it. In the Pagodenburg, for example, which you have under the eyes, the name of which alludes to Chinese pagodas, although its architecture has nothing to do with it, the interior decor is an extravagant mixture of Dutch tiles with Chinese scenes uh, and figures. And you see here the central hall, uh, the central room of that incredible pavilion. The ceiling shows the four continents, that's the, the walls, with the Dutch tiles on the left and a Chinese painted scene on the right. This is a detail where you see indeed what chinoiserie look like in Germany in the first half of the 18th century. 
This is a detail of the ceiling, which has hardly anything to do with chinoiserie, but shows the four continents. And this is another uh, example at Nymphenburg, but in, in a different pavilion, which is called Amalienburg, which has a, uh, this is a kitchen, as you can see, a rather good one, which you could think of copying. It has a similarly mixed decorative vocabulary with panel covered in huge Dutch-like bouquets of flowers here on one side and Chinese scenes here on the other. What is also interesting is to see that the color palette for the ceramic has increased from two colors, blue and white, to a multicolor one, such as uh, on these other Chinese pieces kept here in the collection at the Norton. This is a detail of uh, one of the panels. And these are the vases that have this multicolor uh, palette, which also, as much as Chinese blue and white, came to Europe through the Dutch India Company. <coughs> Germany is a treasure trove of chinoiserie decor. And this is a, a detail of the ceiling, which is also very refined. Germany, as I was saying, is a, a treasure trove of chinoiserie décor, which call our attention on another material, both produced by Oriental craftsmen and reproduced by European ones, that of lacquer. Lacquer was, in a way, uh, nearly more evocative of exoticism as the objects made in lacquer, that is, boxes, trunks, pieces of furniture, such as this cabinet on stand from the collection here at the Norton in the shape of a Chinese house. And this is the, the roof of the house. Uh, these objects uh, uh, were actually much bigger, which meant that on their large surfaces, it was possible to depict landscapes or very detailed scenes, which prompted the minds to escape even more to an unknown and distant world. And I show you here a fantastic one of a pair, a uh, tall cabinet here at the collection, in the collection of the Norton, and the inside of the door showing you the extent of the refinement of these objects with a, a very refined uh, uh, painting for something which you wouldn't see all the time. And this is one uh, big screen here also in the collection, which uh, shows you this landscape and the, the, the sort of appeal of these Chinese scenes to the Westerners. Uh, sometimes these objects, screens, for example, were used in their original form. And here I'm showing you a rather interesting uh, period photograph of the Chinese cabinet or Chinese room in the Stadtschloss in Berlin, the city residence of the Prussian kings. And there you can see from the image that the screens were just pushed onto the walls, just you know, glued onto the walls, just with the opening for the door, so used in a rather uh, simplified uh, manner. Uh, the dado, on the other hand, which you spot here, may have been, uh, I'm showing you period photographs because this was destroyed in the Second World War. The Staatsschloss was completely uh, uh, damaged during the Second World War, so the, these, many of these rooms are only known through period photographs. What one can guess here, though, is that this, uh, the dado, uh, was made of uh, Japanese lacquer, which is thicker than the, the Chinese one in many instances. One of the most charming chinoiserie rooms in Germany is at the Altes Schloss, or Old Schloss, in the Bayreuth Hermitage. And you see that lovely uh, pavilion or small chateau uh, near Bayreuth here uh, on the screen. That must-have pavilion was decorated for the sister of Frederick the Great of Prussia, the celebrated Margravine of Bayreuth, who was much dearer to him than his own wife. In the mid-18th century, he gifted to her a set of lacquer panels 
which you have here on the screen, which were integrated into the decor of the Japanese cabinet or Japanese uh, room at the uh, Old Schloss in uh, Bayreuth. The original screen leaves, which you can spot here, uh, were imaginatively complemented with very elegant Japant borders. Japant being the term to describe lacquer made or painted in Europe to replicate oriental lacquer, while in France it was usually called vernis martin from the name of the artist who uh, were crafting it in a royal workshop. The white borders that you spot here and a made-up dado with lozenges, including uh, bouquets of flowers, gives the whole room uh, a very distinctive style. <clears throat> and here is another detail of that beautiful room. Uh, the mirror on the mantel, you can see it here, is uh, topped by a very amusing Chinese seated figure inspired by that of the Buddhas of which you have a very charming example here in the collection uh, at the Norton. And these Buddhas, of course, had found their way to Europe as much as lacquer or blue and white. The ceiling in the Japanese room at Bayreuth is in painted and gilded stucco and peopled by delightful Chinese characters, such as the one you can see on the screen, one of them drinking tea, of course, from blue and white Chinese porcelain. Another later example of an oriental lacquer room is at Falkenlust, the small hunting pavilion by Cholos Brühl near Cologne, belonging to the flamboyant Prince Bishop and Elector Clement August von Witzelsbach, also a member of the Bavarian ruling family. It shows a similar but slightly more elaborate reuse of uh, Chinese lacquer with the screen leaves inserted into gold and white paneling, as you can see from here. And this is the uh, portrait of uh, uh, Clemens August uh, of Bavaria uh, in his robe de chambre, is in, is in, in his gown. He was a very uh, amusing man, I, 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 but I won't go into that uh, now. <clears throat> Another later example uh, of uh, this uh, Falcon Lust uh, shows you a, a totally Japaned room, which was the very common practice because not everybody could lay their hands on real screens or objects, and Japaning allowed for wider combinations and more colors, as well as to complete full decorating schemes, uh, as is obvious from this suite of rooms I'm going to show you right now. At Ludwigsburg, for example, uh, which was the country residence of the Duke of Württemberg, the lacquer room, which you have on the screen, was painted in the two usual colors of oriental lacquer, black and red with gold motives as you can see here. Uh, a particularly uh, charming example of lacquer work, both authentic and not, is uh, the very elaborate Japanese cabinet, which you have uh, here, uh, at Nymphenburg in the, in the Pagodenburg pavilions. The panels in these Japan rooms may have been screen panels, similar to the screen panels, and you see them, how they were integrated. Uh, here is the Japan part with the doors and the windows around. And these panels may have been uh, screen panels similar to the screen panels from the collection here at the Norton, which are in cut velvet. Others were made of fabrics or painted wallpaper, and this is another room at Nymphenburg that uses the same uh, Japan room for doors, dado, uh, cornice, but has very elongated panels in between all the Japan parts. <coughs> so uh, the technique of Japaning was certainly not restricted to Western Europe, and examples of it are preserved as far as Russia. 
uh, the small palace, actually more of a pavilion, but in Russia it's not the size of the house that matters, but the quality of its owner or inhabitant. Hence, the name given to this pavilion uh, of Palace of Emperor Peter III at Oranienbaum, and I remind you that Peter III was the, the husband of Catherine the Great. It is located west of St. Petersburg and displays the same painted lacquer or Japan work in the hall of paintings here, where the, the pictures are very picturesquely uh, hung, uh, tou a touche touche, as we say in French, side by side, a sort of mid 18th century uh, way of hanging pictures in Russia. And what you can see here is the same type of work on doors and uh, dado. <coughs> What is interesting, and you see also the uh, black uh, background on one side and the uh, red background on, uh, for another uh, room still at the palace uh, at Oranienbaum. This is another detail of that very room, while here you have on the right a very interesting Japan lacquer cabinet made in Russia uh, in about 1760 on a very unusual uh, off-white background, but still with you know Chinese characters or landscapes. Uh, and I'm showing you this because I was very uh, interested in discovering, last week I was in Texas to visit the museums there, to visit to see this Japan American cabinet, uh, which shows a very typical uh, shape for uh, 18th century uh, American cabinets, entirely decorated with a Japan decor, uh, of lacquer, but with still the the ah um, coquille Saint Jacques, the, the shells that you see, for example, in the in the pieces of furniture that you find uh, in uh, Newport, made by people like uh, uh, the Townsend. <coughs> so. Uh, the Chinese palace at Oranienbaum, which bears the name of Chinese palace, but as you can see from this picture, doesn't look Chinese at all. It's a few hundred yards away from that other small pavilion I was just showing you, displays even more elaborate technique for chinoiserie than Japanese. Erected by Antonio Rinaldi for Catherine the Great after she disposed of her cumbersome husband, Peter III, and rather uh, nitwit of a husband, I should say, uh, she was helped in this process by her lover, the famously handsome Grigory Arlov. And so she ascended the throne after a coup d'etat in, in 1762. The palace remained miraculously untouched and intact during the Second World War, although the Nazi troops were very close to it, and it has remained to this day as the Re Russian empress knew it. The large Chinese cabinet that you see here interprets oriental lacquer screens in a unique manner as the whole paneling on the wall is made of wooden marquetry as you can see here, with more small Chinese figures displaying uh, ivory faces and hands. This is a fantastic room. And the parquet floor is as good as the paneling. One of the best uh, chinoiserie interiors uh, I know. The glass bead cabinet, which is very close to that large Chinese uh, room, uh, displays another type of chinoiserie with Chinese-like landscapes with uh, birds and of paradise and other things done in a unique technique of glass beads, shiny glass beads sewn onto a background made of cloth, quite absolutely beautiful, unique. And the, um, the floor originally was made of glass, 
but had, had to be replaced because they found out it was rather fragile. <laughs> so uh, this is a detail of this technique uh, of glass beads sewn onto a, a background of a cloth. And this is Russian imagination at its best for chinoiserie, where you can see sort of Chinese characters mixed with uh, very sort of rococo uh, branches uh, and, and flowers. And that sits still in the room where it was made for. That's the antechamber of the Chinese palace at uh, Oranienbaum. This is another picture of another room where you see here Chinese uh, marble plaques with Chinese inscriptions. Uh, like here, or uh, stone plaques with uh, stone colored marquetry. And that also dates back to the 1760s. Uh, In the great Chinese hall, designed by uh, Charles Cameron for Empress Catherine the Great in the large palace at Tsarske Selo, called today the Catherine Palace, you can see an even crazier uh, scheme with screens here and then Japan uh, panels on the top because the room was eight meters high. And what furniture did you have in that room? But well, just look at this image. You had armchairs designed by Charles Cameron in a Chinese style, quite unusual, because you can spot here lizards, geckos, coming down the arms to crawl onto the floor, <laughs> carved, carved into, uh, into wood, painted and gilded. <clears throat> uh, for wall decoration, the technique of using painted wallpaper or painted silk lined onto paper was even more common than that of screen leaves or Japan panels. The Badenburg Pavilion at Nymphenburg, for example, which you have here uh, on the image, shows birds among flower-covered branches, like here. And this detail also shows you the different type of techniques for Chinese wallpaper, uh, either with white paper sheets of near square shape, and you can spot them, you see here and there, which were glued Onto the, onto the wall, or sometimes narrow paper rolls as today. In a small cabinet in the main schloss at Nymphenburg, the painted paper shows again Chinese figures, picturesque, uh, in, uh, in, in a Chinese landscape with ponds, trees, uh, Chinese rocks. But the ceiling of the room has nothing to do with China or the Orient, showing fancy monkeys painted on a Bérin-like Regence background. That tells us much as to what looked or felt exotic then. China and monkeys alike, it was certainly not authentic nor consistent with reality. Another bedroom at uh, Schloss Nymphenburg plunged its spectator even more deeply, deeply in exotic O, as the figures painted on the wallpaper are here close to life size. The furniture is Japan to complement the wallpaper, but the overmantel here is a delirious contraption in carved and gilded wood with Chinese dragons here and a grotesque mask spilling water on the top. At Orenenbaum, she is in the Chinese palace, it is painted silk that lines the walls of the small Chinese cabinet, as is the case at Tsarskoye Selo here in the Chinese drawing room, which was the room used by Emperor Alexander I, the enemy of Napoleon, uh, throughout his life when he was residing in his country residence. A unique case in the realm of chinoiserie, or should I say Japanery, is a room in Schloss Favorite at Rastatt, the delightful pavilion built for the Margravine of Reichstadt in the 1720s. As you can see from these photographs, while the uh, fireplace displays blue and white ties, and miniature oriental vases, 
the walls are lined with green cloth on to which elaborate Japanese characters done in a succession in the applique technique with uh, panels of cloth embroidered, applied one onto the other, dating back to the 17th century. And this is a rather unique example of uh, uh, Japanerie in, uh, in uh, Germany. After uh, having examined chinoiserie interior or, or decors, we'll continue our survey of chinoiserie with a promenade through actual chinoiserie pavilions. Two publications were essential in the propagation of chinoiseries in the realm of architecture. That of Sir William Chambers, designs of Chinese buildings, furniture, dresses, machines, and utensils, published in London in 1757, and the extensive series of volumes, French volumes, published by Le Rouge, called Jardin Anglo-Chinois, or Anglo-Chinese Gardens, published in France over the course of many years, uh, from 1779 and trying to report on many a Chinese or chinoiserie building or garden in China or in Europe. Some pavilions I'm going to show you now were sometimes influenced or published in these volumes. A relatively classical one was that at Casson, in the northern suburbs of Paris, built for the Bergeret family, they were fermiers généraux, or wealthy tax collectors. You wish you were a tax collector in the 18th century, don't you? Because the French one. It was a very uh, rather shrewd uh, system that made the king sell you uh, the, the product of taxes. So you would give him, let's say, one million livres, one million francs, and then you would have the right to collect the taxes yourself. Do you think you, would, you were collecting just one million? Of course, they were collecting much more, which meant that they were able to uh, put together fantastic artwork collections, but also uh, built beautiful houses or pavilions. So this Casson, uh, Chinese pavilion is rather tame. If you compare it, for example, with this one, which is the Chinese pagoda uh, at Rambouillet, one of the estates belonging to the cousin of the king, Louis XVI, the Duc de Pintièvre. And this was designed around 1780, and it's slightly fancier, as you can see these flying dragons uh, on the top. The philosopher's pavilion at Bagatelle was designed by architect Bélanger for the Comte d'Artois, the brother of Louis XVI, and there you can spot again Chinese dragons. Uh, the lake, uh, this is the Chinese tent at Bagatelle, another uh, Chinese uh, contraption made for the brother of the king, uh, all with this sort of strap or lattice work. And, and still with Chinese dragons. And this one is even fancier. It's the Lake Pagoda at the Folie saint James in Neuilly-sur-Seine in the outskirts of Paris, which was built in about 1784 for the Baron Baudard de Saint-James and showing the same type of uh, wooden lattice work and, again, flying dragons. The fantasy of these chinoiserie pavilions may have often disappeared due to the fragility of their architecture and that of their building materials, as they were very often made of painted wood. Some, though, have survived to this day for about 250 years and sometimes in the most difficult of climate. And I'm going to show them to you. One is the so-called Creek Inn Pavilion in the park at Tsarskoye Selo, still in Russia, the favorite country residence of Catherine the Great. It earned this name because of its weather vane, which was creaking, and you can see it here, in the wind, a supposedly exotic melody. Another is the cross bridge, still at Sarskoye Selo, uh, which is shown here in a, in a 19th century watercolor, and you can see this small room perched in the middle of the four flights of steps towering upon the canal 
running through the Alexander Park. And this is the palace of Catherine the Great in the back. And this is the pavilion as it stands today with these four flights and, and its small room. There is also a collection of Chinese bridges at Tsarskoye Selo, uh, such as this one, this one of the small Chinese bridges, which it is quite unusual to see under snow. And here it is uh, without uh, any snow. And you can again, yet again, uh, spot the, the flying dragons. The large Chinese bridge with its life-size figures in metal, painted metal, holding lamp posts, to me earns the medal. I mean, the medal for chinoiserie bridges. It's, it is very imaginative uh, and has a railing, which you can spot here in this uh, 1930s photograph, but you better see it here, with stone vases and uh, fake coral branches as a banister. And that's what it looks like without uh, snow. Similarly, the Chinese tea house, or Chinese house in German, at Sans Souci in Potsdam, was bringing China right to Frederick the Great's doorstep. Built for the Prussian king between 1754 and 1764, it remains one of the best surviving examples of chinoiserie pavilion. Where else, indeed, does a company of life-sized, carved and gilded sandstone characters have a snack? Here. Yeah. Engaged in, there, there, you see. Well, she doesn't seem very pleased <laughs> to take it. And then they engage in conversation here. <clears throat> or they play musical instruments. And all these figures are life-size, carved sandstone. Uh, and you have them all around the facade of the pavilion. In the central hall, which you spot here, other fancy Chinese figures are leaning over a trompe l'oeil balustrade looking at the uh, courtiers of Frederick the Great. And this is a detail where you spot them here and with a sort of chinoiserie chandelier and a chinoiserie bracket still in that same room. And this is another view of the cupola uh, where you spot, again, monkeys uh, living next to the Chinese people. So, and this is another building at Sans Souci, Chinoiserie Pavilion, uh, the Drachen House or Dragon House on the left, which is obviously inspired by the engraving of Sir William Chambers I was telling you about earlier on as it was uh, published in Design of Chinese Buildings and actually uh, is supposed to show the porcelain pagoda at Canton, uh, which was one of the most extravagant uh, buildings, Chinese buildings ever known. This is a, a view of Tsarske Selo still, uh, but in the 18th century, you spot here the palace of Catherine the Great and the creaking uh, pavilion here. And here, what is there? It's only this. As far as scale is concerned, you know that the Russians, well, mind you, a bit like the Americans, they like and they think big. So this is the largest chinoiserie village ever made. Uh, it was designed in the Alexander Park at Tsarskoye Selo uh, and still stands today uh, with a main pagoda in the middle and uh, others surrounding it and then a row of Chinese building leading, leading you into uh, the courtyard. This is a detail of the pagoda, of the central pagoda, uh, where you see that, well, you had to be clever because in the Russian climate, wooden buildings wouldn't have survived very long. So all this is made in painted metal. And there is still a flying dragon. 
Not far from that village, Chinese village, stood the Chinese theater Catherine the Great had built. Unfortunately, it didn't survive the Nazi occupation during the Second World War, and it is known through us, to us sorry, through period photographs. It was an extremely large structure, which you have here on the screen, there, with a central block there in the back, uh, housing the theater, while the side wings held the actors' and actresses' dressing rooms. There. The stage here is shown with, a, again, a chinoiserie uh, uh, stage set with an incredible pagoda uh, in the distance, while here is one of the imperial boxes in the Chinese style, again, and the inside, which is exactly well, like uh, what I showed you earlier in uh, princely residences with these sort of Japan uh, elongated uh, panels alluding to those of screens and the made-up dado. I'll end our promenade tonight with two delightful chinoiserie creations which are not that well known but uh, which can be still enjoyed today and which I advise you to go see. The first one is at the Palatina Cinese of the Bourbon Kings in Palermo in Sicily. The architecture of the building is close to extravagant, although not much influenced by known examples of chinoiserie pavilions uh, from Chambers, Le Rouge, or else. It is accessible through a semicircular portico with a double staircase in front uh, uh, of the facade and has two terraces, which you spot here uh, on the top, on the upper level, to enjoy the surrounding views, while two spiral exterior, uh, supposedly Chinese-looking uh, staircases on either side of the building enable servants to gain access to the first and the second level balconies, although there was already a service staircase within the, the building. The interiors of the pavilion are not only in the chinoiserie style, but the Chinese ones are by far the most elaborate. The central first level hall is hung with panels of Chinese painted silk and Chinese inscriptions here, and Chinese looking uh, furniture. While on either side of this main room, you have smaller cabinet with close to life-size Chinese figures or uh, other Chinese uh, characters in very not Chinese landscapes. And this is another uh, in the dining room. Oh, this dining room is absolutely fantastic because there is a, uh, what the French call in table volante, a flying table that enabled um, the Bourbon kings to dine without having to see uh, one uh, servant because the whole mechanism of the table goes down into the floor and you have uh, sort of uh, uh, cylinders on top of which you would have the plate of each guest uh, and then you would ring a bell and the, um, the cylinder would go down and the servants... Uh, would be uh, uh, in the sort of basement level, would put on the cylinder the plate with what you had asked, and then bring it up. So that's the, what the French call uh, uh, table volante. You have still one. You can see one in, um, in Germany, at the Belvedere, in Weimar. You have some in Russia, at Tsarske Selo. There used to be one at Versailles, but it's no longer in existence. So these are the decors of that particular room. Uh, what I find absolutely out of this world, though, are the ceilings of these Chinese cabinets in the Palazzina Cinese. Look at this. The imagination of the two artists, Italian artists, 
who painted on the ceiling these figures and those ones and pagodas and, and sort of flying dragons again. I think we have, well, I think uh, uh, Guillain has to sort of find a dragon and put him in a cage within the, within the, the Chinese rooms here. And the, the names of the artists are Vincenzo Riolo and Rosario Silvestri. And this is another one of this beautiful uh, painted chinoiserie ceiling. <coughs> uh, the uh, last room I shall dwell upon, though, is actually not a pavilion, but within a royal palace, that of Aranjuez in Spain, some 60 kilometers south of Madrid. I chose to end my promenade with it because to me it encapsulates the sort of marriage of both the East and the West, which was the core of our subject tonight. It enables us to conclude with the material with, with which we started. This room, indeed another Chinese cabinet, is made, it's the facade of uh, the palace at Aranjuez, and this is the room. This room is entirely made of porcelain the same porcelain which prompted the first craze after China. It is not Chinese porcelain, though, but Spanish one, from the royal manufactory of Il Buen Retiro. What is extraordinary is that the artists who made this room were not Spanish for one bit. They were all Italian. Why? Well, when he became king of Spain in 1759, King Charles III, who was known as King of Naples under the name of Charles VII before, but his father died in Spain, which meant that he had to go back to Madrid. So the former King of Naples decided he could not leave Naples without packing with him in his suitcases, simply and plainly, the whole porcelain manufactory of Capodimonte which he had created in Naples at great expense and, of course, didn't want to leave behind. So everybody and everything, the craftsmen, the necessary materials, the technical tools, the molds, everything was brought to Spain by ship to create a new porcelain manufactory, which was renamed Del Buen Retiro, as it stood in the garden of that particular palace in Madrid. The cabinet itself was a recreation of another room in porcelain made for the uh, wife of the, the, the king, uh, Queen Maria Amalia, at the royal villa at Portici, which is outside of Naples, not very far from the Vesuvius. And it is the same engineer, uh, Giuseppe Gricci, who had made the one in Italy, who was responsible for making the new one in Spain. There, it is even more elaborate as the whole room, but for the marble floor, which you spot here, is in porcelain. As you can see from these photographs, the scheme was of an extraordinary technical complexity. All the panels, indeed, seem to be made of one piece of porcelain, but they are not. There are quite a number of porcelain pieces uh, seamlessly assembled as all the edges of each piece is disguised under branches, foliage, or a motive that will run across the width of the whole panel. <clears throat> it is interesting also to see, and you spot them here, that uh, the chairs designed for that porcelain cabinet are in Japan, white lacquer, very similar to the furniture piece I showed you made in Russia at Oranienbaum. The quality of the porcelain there is absolutely stunning, as you can see from this detail. Uh, the three-dimensional quality of the figures and the ornaments lending it uh, an unusually realistic feel. And there you can see another uh, detail, and that's in the back. And here are the Japan off-white uh, Chinese chair, which are exactly Chimperdale chairs covered in a Chinese decor. 
And these are other details. Isn't that fantastic? And the dragon, another one, flying, <laughs> still. Uh, what is also extraordinary is that the whole ceiling of that room is made uh, in porcelain, which was another uh, technical challenge, as you can imagine, because all the various ceramic pieces that you spot here had to be secured to a wooden base which was attached onto the vault. So this last example, and here are a few more details, uh, of chinoiserie sums up for me the dream into which the Chinese ware of porcelain sent up all Europeans when they started to reach the West. And then the lengths to which the Europeans went to recreate them in one way or another for our everlasting pleasure. Thank you. Do you have any questions? If anyone has a question, let me know. I'll come over with the mic because we're recording. What did you find best? Yes. Um, early in your lecture, you had one uh, watercolor of that uh, porcelain trianon. Yes. I don't remember that. Was it built? Oh, of course it was built, but it was very soon uh, destroyed. Right. It used to stand where the, basically, uh, uh, well, where the Grand Trianon is today. Right. Uh, it was entirely painted outside, so not very uh, durable. Uh, and it lasted until the, the end of the 17th century when uh, Louis XIV decided that it was not big enough and that he should have a grander retreat pavilion, which was designed by Jules ardin moinsart and was made out of marble, which was, of course, much uh, stronger. But uh, uh, it is known through engravings. Uh, it was very, very fancy. Uh, but uh, not many um, things survive from the inside. <clears throat> so what would you take home? <laughs> that? You see, I always say when I'm in a museum, I force myself to, to think uh, I should take one object per room. One painting, one porcelain vase, etc., because it, it makes you uh, think of not particularly what is most valuable, but what you prefer, what you like best. And then you can dream with it, <laughs> even if you don't own it. What do you have in your house? Uh, well, I have far too many things. <laughs> too many books, too many books. I'm thinking if I were to take something... I think I would take that room because it's absolutely fascinating, you know, because the light plays on the surface of the ceramic and then you have all these figures. It's by far uh, one of the most elaborate uh, decor in this type. And the, the fact also that it's uh, nearly three-dimensional makes it even stronger as opposed to, you know, being two-dimensional or even uh, it's, it's, and it's so much stronger and, and uh, in color than lacquer. That, that's what I would take. There is a, another one, uh, so somebody else can have it. It is at, it is at now, it is uh, at Capodimonte in the palace uh, where you have the famous painting museum in Naples because the Villa Reale, the royal villa at Portici, uh, not far from Vesuvius, uh, no longer exists. So the room was dismantled and brought to Capodimonte. So two of us can have <laughs> one of these cabinets. <laughs> Yes. No, 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 no. That's why I showed you renderings uh, of them. No, no. Only at Bagatelle you have the main pavilion. You have the grotto, which is still there, but the Chinese bridge is no longer in existence. Uh, Bagatelle is undergoing a restoration campaign 
uh, right now. But it's known through engravings and, and views made for the Comte d'Artois. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one, you know, we, we could spend hours because uh, I just deliberately put aside many other interesting examples. I didn't show you, for example, the Brighton Pavilion because everybody knows it. I thought it was more interesting for you to see these smaller German or Russian examples which uh, people sometimes haven't seen. Yes. Simple question. When were these porcelains made? That, uh, yes. that was made uh, in the early 1760s. Between 17, yes. Yeah, exactly, you see? But yeah, you see, you know, well, he is a good museum director. <laughs> you see, C, C for Charles. C for Charles, 1763, that's it, answered. Uh, well, this was made in Europe. Uh, well, apart from the, the porcelain pagoda uh, that Laura can tell you about in uh, Canton, I'm not in sure. Nanjing. In Nanjing. Nanjing. Ah, yes. Uh, One of the seven wonders of the world. Yeah, but uh, it's known only through engravings. And uh, yes, when was it destroyed? Uh -huh. <coughs> they were much more interested in selling us uh, <laughs> Chinese export. You can see pieces of it in China, and there's pieces of it at the Metropolitan, the Brooklyn Museum, the Nanjing Provincial Museum. Uh, very famous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, let's give our speaker, Emmanuel Ducamp, a big hand. And if you have a few questions, you could still go to see uh, Emmanuel. <laughs> Thank you so much, and have a wonderful uh, evening. <laughs>